Hey, and welcome back. I'm Robert Breaker, and I've got a sermon that I just couldn't wait to get out there and preach and put forth. The Lord uh, laid this on my heart and on my mind probably a couple of weeks ago, and I've just been tickled pink. I can't wait to give this message. Um, I'm a little bit under the weather, so please excuse my voice. I'll try to get through this the best I can. I've been sick a little bit and, and tired and going through some things. But uh, thank God for a good mother. I remember my mom used to tell me as a kid, she used to say, Son, there'll be times when you just don't feel like doing something and you're just too tired or you might... She said, but part of being a man is doing it anyway. <laughs> so thank God for a good mother that always taught me, look, sometimes something's got to be done. So I'm unable to, to put this off till next week. I've got to get this done every week for the last three years, putting a new sermon in English and Spanish and uh, putting that on YouTube and posting that to thecloudchurch.org. And so today, I, even though my voice is going out, I'm going to go ahead and preach this message. I've, I've been looking forward to this message. If you'll remember, last week's message was on the subject of rightly dividing the New Testament. And I talked about how there are so many false denominations within Christianity today, so many cults, that are messed up and they have false doctrine because they don't rightly divide the word of truth. And we looked at right dividing last time. We rightly divided the New Testament. Today we're going to rightly divide the apostles. And last time I read to you 2 Timothy 2.15, and I showed you that that's a command in Scripture to rightly divide the word of truth. And I also showed you last week that there's also a warning in the context that goes along with that. Warning to those who don't rightly divide, because if not, you'll fall into more ungodliness and into false doctrine. So, I studied that last week, and I showed how many so-called denominations within Christianity today, they don't read the entire book of Acts. And because of that, they don't see Acts as it is. It is a book of transition. It is a book of change. There is a lot of changing going on in the book of Acts. And you can't just take something from the early book of Acts and try to make that doctrine for today. It won't work. You have to read the entire book of Acts, because the book of Acts is a book of transition, a book of change. And I showed you last week, and I said this a lot, I always preach on this, and a lot of people you know, are encouraged. They say, Brother Breaker, we get disappointed unless you're rightly dividing every week. We want to learn more. And then other people say, well, you know, uh, we, don't, we don't like hearing the same message every time. Well, that's why I try to mix it up. That's why I try to give you different things and hope that it's a blessing to you. But the book of Acts is a transitional book. It changes from Peter to Paul, from Israel to the church, and from the Jews to the Gentiles. So as the book of Acts is taking place, we see this change taking place. So what we're going to do today, we're going to rightly divide the apostles. I'm going to take you to the apostles in the Bible, show you who they were, and then we're going to look and we're going to ask them, um, so is there one specific apostle that we're supposed to follow, or do we follow all of the apostles, or do we follow a couple of the apostles? I mean, who are the apostles? What do they do? Why are they there? And which apostle is the apostle for us today? Now, before we get started, I would be amiss to not mention Jesus Christ first. So go with me to Hebrews chapter 3. We are doing our verse-by-verse -verse Bible study through the book of Hebrews, and uh, we are now at chapter 3. And I've been enjoying doing that every week. I try to put it out around Monday or Tuesday, and it's usually for you know people that meet at homes on Wednesdays to have a Wednesday, Wednesday night service. And I usually post my Sunday sermons uh, on Friday or Saturday, and that's usually for people that are meeting in homes to watch on Sunday. Now, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1, tells us about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Notice what he's called. Hebrews 3, Wherefore, brethren, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the Apostle, capital A, and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. So the Bible starts out by calling Jesus Christ an Apostle. So how can we start a discussion on apostles without mentioning Jesus Christ? He is called an apostle in the Bible. Now the word apostle means one sent. So an apostle is someone who is sent somewhere. It also means, you know, I looked it up in the dictionary, it also can mean a messenger, an ambassador, or a delegate. What is a delegate? Someone who is delegated to do something. 
So, we cannot forget our study of the apostles without mentioning Jesus Christ, who is the chief apostle, the apostle. And he was one who was sent. And all through the book of John, it tells us over and over that Jesus was sent. He was sent from the Father. Let me give you an example. John 8.18 John 18, 8 and verse 18 says, I am one that bear witness of myself, Jesus is speaking, and the Father that sent me beareth witness of me. So Jesus Christ was sent. You know, one of the verses that a lot of children learn, one of the first verses they learn is John 3, 6, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So Jesus Christ was sent from heaven by God the Father for a purpose. He was delegated something to him to do. What was that? To die for our sins. So Jesus is an apostle. Yes, the Bible does call Jesus an apostle. But he's also God, and he's from heaven. And so today what I want to do when I talk about the apostles, I'm going to talk about the 12 earthly apostles. That's what I'm going to focus in on. Uh, Jesus is the heavenly apostle. Amen. Jesus came from heaven. And he is God, manifest in the flesh, who died on the cross for our sins. Let me go ahead and put the blood up here like I try to do every week. And it's all about that blood that Jesus shed. He is our apostle because he is the one that was sent to us. But he is the heavenly apostle. What I want to talk about today as I rightly divide the apostles is I want to deal with these 12 down here on earth. The 12 apostles. And there are 12 apostles in the Bible. So I'll call those the 12. Now... I'm not going to get into a, a debate about this. <laughs> um, a lot of Christians like to debate, and there is a debate on how many apostles are there in the Bible. And some people say, well, there's 13, and then others say, no, there's 14, and then others, well, actually there's 16, 7, and you're all over the place, and you can get into an argument with other Christians about how many apostles there are. If you want to win the argument, go over to the book of Revelation, where it talks about New Jerusalem, and it says that, uh, is it the foundation, or is it the gate? Uh, one of those, it says, is the twelve apostles. <laughs> so in God's eyes, there must only be twelve, and the name of each one of those twelve is, is put into uh, uh, the New Jerusalem. So uh, there must only be twelve, but yet in the Bible, it, it makes it seem like there was more than that. So God only counts twelve. Now, surely Jesus is not counted because Jesus is the apostle from heaven. So the apostles here on earth, there were 12 of them in Jesus' earthly ministry, but then we have a problem. We have a big problem because one of them was a devil. So he doesn't count. And so as we read through the Bible, it looks like God replaces that apostle. Now in one place, it looks like he's replaced with a guy named Matthias, but you never hear that name ever again. But through the rest of the book of Acts, there's another apostle, and he's the one that... That, that gets dominance. He's the one that, that more of the Bible is written about in the New Testament. He's the one that God bears witness to as the apostle for us today. And we'll get to that. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and stop here and I'm going to write up here the name of the twelve apostles. And then I'm going to take you to the passage to read it. So why don't you begin starting to look in Matthew chapter 10 verses 2 through 4. Go to Matthew chapter 10 verses 2 through 4 and we will read that together after I've put the names of the apostles up here, okay? Okay, so here's what we've got. We've got the 12 apostles, and I've gone ahead and put their name up here. And notice I marked out the last one and replaced it with someone else. So here are the 12. So I ask you to go to uh, Matthew chapter 10. Let's go ahead and read that. I want you to see that with your own eyes. I want you to see the names of these apostles. They were the disciples of Jesus, and they're also called the apostles. So here's our first one, which was Jesus. But like I say, he is in a class of his own. Amen. He's God manifest in the flesh, Jesus is, and he's one sent from heaven. But when he got down here to earth, then Jesus picked out twelve hand-picked men, which he called his disciples, and later he called his apostles. Why did he call them apostles? Because Jesus sent them to someone. Who were these apostles sent to? Well, at first they were sent only to Jews. But in Matthew chapter 10, Verse 2 through 4, we see the names of the apostles. So Matthew chapter 10, verse 2. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. The first Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother. James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother. And then it says, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the publican, James the son of Alphaeus, and Lebaeus, whose surname was Thaddeus, 
And so if it's a surname, let me take out that little comma there. And then it says here, Simon the Canaanite, and then the last one mentioned, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. So there was one of the disciples that betrayed Jesus. That was Judas. And when you read in the Bible, it, it literally tells us, but Judas was a devil. I believe that means the devil entered into him, probably Satan himself. He was called also the son of perdition. So there were 12 disciples or 12 apostles of Jesus Christ, but one of them fell. He lost his apostleship, and that was Judas. So these are the 12 apostles. Now some of them you may know. You might have heard of some of them. Others you may never have heard of before. You know, like, who, who's Labaius? You know, you know, who's this guy? A lot of these you just read through quickly in your Bible. You don't even pay attention to the names. But these were the 12 hand-picked men of Jesus Christ. Now, there's no way I'm going to get to talk about all of these. Some are more famous than others. So I'm going to put a little star by each one that I want to mention. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at these and we're going to rightly divide. These would be, I guess, your, your most well-known of the disciples. And we're going to talk about these three in particular. Now, I forgot to put that James and John were the sons of Zebedee. Those were the sons of Zebedee. I always thought that was a neat name, Zebedee. And they're also called the sons of Thunder. And there's another passage in the Bible, in, in the... Uh, in the Gospels that, that mentions them, I believe that is found in Mark chapter 3, verses 16 through 19. Now, you don't have to go there if you don't want to. If you do, pause this and, and go look at that and read that as well, because that's the second place that mentions all 12. Mark chapter 3, verses 16 through 19. And it gives us a little bit of extra information in that passage. It tells us that these two, James and John, were the sons of Zebedee. They were also called the sons of Thunder, Boagernes, or something like that. And so they're called the Sons of Thunder. I've never figured out why they're called the Sons of Thunder. Uh, it's quite an interesting name, but that's the, the nickname that was given them, the Sons of Thunder. So these are the apostles. Now we're going to look at these apostles. We're going to ask the question, which one is the apostle to us? Did they have different functions and different jobs? What was, what was the deal? Well, we know for sure that the guy Judas, he was the bad guy, and he was the one that they called the treasurer. He was the money bags, Mr. Moneybags Judas. And we're told in the Bible that he was actually stealing from money. Can you imagine literally stealing from Jesus Christ while he's here on earth? It's kind of sad. But these are the twelve, and we're going to focus in on these three because they're the most prominent, the most uh, mentioned in the Bible. And we're going to rightly divide the apostles. We're going to look at the apostles, we're going to ask, is one of these apostles like the one that we're to follow today, or do we follow them all? Uh, is one more important than the other? I mean, these are great questions, looking at the apostles in the Bible. Because what we find is there are many denominations, and what they do is they choose to follow a certain apostle, and they end up following the wrong one. Or they take one apostle, and then they found their doctrine on what that apostle said without rightly dividing, and they end up in error and mistake. So we're going to start out today with Peter. We're going to look at Peter. Old Simon Peter was one of the apostles. And old Peter was an uh, interesting fella, but when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you can't help but either feel sorry for Peter, or just sometimes you just want to smack Peter on the head. If you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you find out that Peter is very often opening his mouth and inserting his foot. Peter is always saying the dumbest things in the Bible. Peter is always doing the wrong thing and saying the wrong thing. So Peter is an interesting person. He's just one of those people. You ever met someone like a Peter? You know, that just kind of just do their own thing and don't think about what they did, and then they have to go, well, I'm sorry, I didn't even realize I did that. That's Peter. Peter was one of those. He always seemed like he was doing the wrong thing and saying the wrong thing. Let me give you some examples. But first, let's find out where did Jesus meet Peter. Let's go to Matthew chapter 4. Peter is a very prominent apostle. And rightly so, because he was the, always the one that would speak first. And he eventually became, in the early book of Acts, the spokesperson of the church. But for a time, not for always. And so Peter, in fact, is someone that is looked upon by many Christians today as our apostle. In fact, there's a gigantic church which calls itself the Catholic Church, 
that exalts Peter above every other of the apostles, and they say Peter was the first pope. Oh, really? Really? Well, that's what they say. Let's, let's see if we can find that in the Bible. And so they say, we are the church that Jesus built, founded on Peter, and they say that Peter is our apostle. Well, let's rightly divide the word of truth and see if that's true, if we should say that Peter is our apostle. Or if just possibly they, they might be a little bit wrong in saying that. Let's go to Matthew chapter 4, and here's where Jesus met Peter. Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 to 20. I kind of like Peter in many ways because Peter was a fisherman, and I like to go fishing. So I kind of like Peter. Uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 18, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. All right. Now, Simon had three names. Peter, his other name was Simon, and his other name was Cephas. So when you read through the Bible and you see Simon, or Cephas, or Peter, that's talking about the Apostle Peter. He had three different names. So quite, quite important to remember. Uh, some of the other ones did as well, kind of like Labaius, his surname was Thaddeus, so he was called two different things. And so Paul, Paul was called Paul, and then before he was Paul, his name was Saul. So they have more than one name, so you've got to understand that. So Jesus is walking by here in verse 18, and he, and he sees a guy named Peter, and Andrew his brother. So Andrew and Peter are brothers. And they were fishers, it says. Verse 19, And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Verse 20, And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, they went to this other place, and they found these other guys, which were the next ones here in the list, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. So here you have Andrew and his brother Peter. And the Lord Jesus Christ comes by and says to these fishermen, Hey, follow me. Forsake everything. Just come with me. And they did. <laughs> now, I don't know any other time in history when someone would do that. You know, if I was out trying to make a living, and I had a net, and I had a boat, and I had, this was my livelihood, and some guy comes along and goes, hey, follow me. I wouldn't just go, well, okay, ba -ba -doom, and just follow him and leave everything I had for somebody to come steal. <laughs> but they did. Peter and Simon, uh, excuse me, Peter and Andrew followed Jesus. Now, there must have been something about Jesus that they saw that made them give up what they had there to follow him. So what about this guy named Peter? Who was Peter? Well, let's look some more at Peter. I'm going to show you some things in the Bible about Peter. First of all, let's go to Matthew chapter 8 and verse 14. Old Simon Peter, he's called. Peter, or Simon Peter, or Cephas. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 14, we read these words. And when Jesus was coming to Peter's house and saw his wife's mother laid and sick of a fever... <laughs> And he touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she arose and ministered unto them. Now, did you catch what I just read? The Bible says that Jesus went to the house of Peter and found Peter's wife's mother. What is that? Peter's mother-in-law. And she was sick, and Jesus healed her. If a man has a mother-in-law, what does that mean that he has? He has a wife. He's married. So this guy named Peter was married. It's also in Mark chapter 1 and verse 30, and also in Luke chapter 4 and verse 38. So we got three verses there that says Peter was married. Now how does that stand for the Catholic Church? The Roman Catholic Church says, our apostle is Peter, he was the first pope. And you say, oh yeah, well, what, is, what is a pope? Well, a pope is a, is a guy that never gets married. Okay, so the first pope was married. But yet, in their church they say, but if you're a pope, you can't get married. Why? You say that Peter was the first pope and he was married, so why aren't you? It's kind of weird, isn't it? <laughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and verse 5, Peter's not making a very good pope. He was married and the popes aren't supposed to be married, so, huh, interesting. You know, a lot of Roman Catholics don't read their Bibles. They need to, they need to. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and verse 5 says, Jesus, uh, uh, excuse me, Paul is speaking, and he says, Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord, and Cephas? <laughs> Cephas is Peter. The Apostle Paul says, Don't we have the right? Don't we have uh, the power to get married if we want to, like old Peter was? But you see, the Catholic Church says, No, Peter was the first pope. And they say, It's, it's illegal for popes to get married. It's not right. And yet in the Bible, the, the Apostle Paul says, uh, Don't we have the right to get married? So, not very good Pope, old Peter is, but yet that denomination claims that he's their apostle. Well, they're not doing too good when it comes to rightly dividing the apostles. They claim he was the first Pope, 
And they say a pope can't get married, and yet Peter was married. Doesn't make too good a pope, does he? Well, as you go through the Bible and you begin to study more and more about this guy named Peter, it's easy to see that Peter always seemed to be getting in trouble, doing the wrong thing, saying the wrong thing. It's kind of funny. And I don't think he did it on purpose. I think sometimes he just did something stupid. But it's, it's, it's uncanny how through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, over and over and over and over, this guy Peter seems to always be doing the wrong thing and saying the wrong thing. Why is that? Mark chapter 14, verse 37. Let me give you some examples. Mark 14, 37. And he cometh, who's he? It's Jesus. Jesus was praying. And he cometh and findeth them sleeping, and saith unto Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? Couldest thou not watch one hour? <laughs> so Peter and the other apostles are there, are other disciples, and Jesus goes and, and comes back to pray, and it took him less than an hour to go and come back, and he finds them sleeping. And Jesus says, Peter, man, come on! Wake up! <laughs> Why didn't he say that to the other apostles? Why did he say it to Peter? Almost sounds like Peter had a habit of falling asleep a lot. And he shouldn't have. John chapter 13. Here's another example. I'm sure Jesus just kind of slapped his head a lot of time when he was dealing with Peter. Because Peter would always say something and Jesus would say, like, come on, Peter! <laughs> over and over as we read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we see that. John 13, 5 through 9. After he had poured out into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded, this is Jesus, he cometh, then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Verse 7, Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Now watch what Peter says to God manifest on the flesh. Bowing down before him, washing his feet. Notice what Peter says. Verse 8, Peter said unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. <laughs> what a thing to say to your Lord and Savior when he's right there in front of you. He comes to wash your feet and you say, Thou shalt never wash my feet. What a thing to say. Well, then he says, Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Now notice how quick Simon Peter said, changes. Verse 9, Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and head. <laughs> Can you see how frustrated Jesus must have got with Peter sometimes? Peter says, you're never going to wash my feet. Jesus says, Peter, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part of me. Okay, Jesus, wash my hands and my head too. <laughs> what kind of person is that that tells you, no, and this is okay, now just do it all? I mean, just a strange bird. Oh, Peter is a strange bird. Uh, let's go to John chapter 13. John chapter 13, we're in chapter 13, let's go to verse 37. So Jesus is talking and he's telling the disciples, you know, that, that uh, he's going to have to die and rise again. And he's telling them about, you know, what's going to happen and how they're going to deny him and, and run away from him and not follow him. Verse 37, Peter said unto him, Jesus, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Peter says, man, I'm willing to die for you, Jesus. Look at verse 38. Jesus answered him, wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Really? Really, Peter? Are you going to die for me? Really? Jesus says, verily, verily, I say unto thee, the, clock, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. Now, hopefully you know your Bible and you know the story. Uh, three times they came and asked Peter, aren't you with that Jesus guy? No, leave me alone. Right, hey, weren't you with that Jesus Leave me alone. Three times he denied Jesus Christ. And yet, he said to Jesus to his face, I'll die for you. No, he didn't. He was scared to death, and three times he denied Jesus. Oh, Peter's not looking like a very good pope, is he? <laughs> he seems like he's always saying one thing and doing another. Go with me to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, Jesus says to his disciples, you know, hey guys, uh, who do you say that I am? And Peter speaks up and says something good for once. Peter speaks up in verse 16 of Matthew 16, and he says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, Amen. You're blessed, Simon Barjona. He said, Yeah, you got it right. That's who I am. I am the Christ. But then, not a few more verses later, <laughs> not that many verses later, verse 21 
From that time forth began Jesus to show in his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Now, verse 32. So Jesus is saying, look, I'm going to be delivered up to the Pharisees. I'm going to be killed and I'm going to rise again the third day. Verse 22. Then Peter took him, took who? Jesus. And began to rebuke him. What? Peter is rebuking the Lord Jesus Christ. Saying, be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Now wait a minute. Jesus Christ just said to, to, to Peter, this is the prophecy that I give unto you. So Jesus is prophesying about his death, burial, and resurrection. And Peter says, this won't happen to you. So Peter is basically saying, no, Jesus, you're a liar. Your prophecy isn't true. What a thing to say. Verse 23, but he, this is Jesus, turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me. <laughs> now, the Catholic Church says our apostle is the apostle Peter. Jesus Christ called Peter Satan. Does that mean the Pope is Satan? No, I'm not saying that, but it's interesting that there's people out there, the Catholics want to say that Peter was the first Pope. Well, he's not a very good Pope. I mean, he's married. He's always trying to correct Jesus and tell Jesus, well, you're wrong, Jesus. Always saying the wrong thing, and Jesus says, Peter, you know what? You're Satan. <laughs> How dare you, Peter? Stand up, and when I prophesy, say that it's not true. Not a very good first Pope if Peter was indeed the first pope. Now, I don't believe he was. I've studied history. I don't see that. I do not see popes in the Bible. Matter of fact, I do not see the Catholic Church starting with Peter. As a matter of fact, there's only one guy in the Bible that went to Rome, and that's this guy, Paul. And if you... Well, let's go there. Let me show you this. See, the Roman Catholic Church says that their church started with Peter. And they say Peter went to Rome and sat down and became the first pope. Well, if you have a Bible... You go to the First Peter, the book that Peter wrote, and you go to the last chapter, First Peter chapter 5, and look at verse 13. First Peter 5.13 says, The church that is at Babylon elected together with you, saluteth you, and so doth Marcus my son. Here the Apostle Peter says, Hey, all of us over here in Babylon at the church where I'm visiting, we say hi. <laughs> you see, Peter never went to Rome according to the Bible. So you've got the Catholic Church lying to you, telling you that Peter was the first pope. Peter never went to Rome. It's not in the Bible. In the Bible, Peter says, I'm writing from Babylon. Babylon's the other direction from Rome. So you have this Catholic Church saying, yeah, well, our tradition is that Peter was the first pope in Rome. Well, he's a horrible pope. Jesus called him Satan, and he was married, and he didn't even end up in Rome. He was in Babylon. Now, after Jesus rose again from the dead, even Paul has something to say to Peter. And what does he do? Go to Galatians chapter 2. Now, I don't know if I'll have time to read all this, but Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. Paul is speaking about the time that he went and visited Peter. And look what he says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. Paul says, man, I got in his face and said, Peter, man, what are you doing, dude? <laughs> Peter was doing something wrong, and Paul was like, literally withstood him to the face. That means he got in his face and said, what are you doing? Verse 12, for before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. Verse 13, and of the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, and so much as Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. Now verse 14, but when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou being a Jew, livest after the manner of the Gentiles, and not as the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as the Jews? So Paul says, I literally rebuked Peter. Why? Verse 14. Because he walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. So Peter didn't even walk according to the truth of the gospel. And Paul said, I had to rebuke him. Now, this is scripture, what I'm giving you. Are you getting the picture? Peter is a horrible example of a pope. He is not the pope. He's never been a pope. There were no popes in that time. The Catholic Church really started in about 325 AD, and I don't have time to get into that. 
But you had during that time a man named Constantine who joined the church together with the state. And what he did is he joined together an apostate church to the state. There was a true church and there was a false church during that time. And you know what they called true Christians? 100 years, 200 years, 300 years after Jesus? There was a name that they gave them. They called them Paulicians. Because true Christians said, hey, we follow Paul. We don't follow Peter. But the false religious denomination said, well, we need to have a, an, a pope. We need a pontifus maximus to run the church because we're, we're putting together the church and the state. And, uh, well, the state has a pontifus maximus, and that sounds like pope. So we'll just take the head of the church and we'll call him the, the new pontifus, the new pope. That was a pagan uh, title. And so they joined it. So true Christianity was always following Paul, not Peter throughout the church age. Now, the church did start with Jesus, and in the early part of the church, Peter did preach and teach. But when it started, it was only Jews. It wasn't Gentiles. Gentiles got saved later in Acts chapter 10. So it's very, very, very wrong, if you're a Bible believer, to call Peter the first pope. Peter is a horrible example of what they claim a pope is supposed to be. What does he do? He's married. He's always saying something he shouldn't. He was rebuked by Paul. <laughs> Not a very good pope. So I don't believe that he was a pope. Not only that, one more time. Let me show you one more thing. Here's Acts chapter 10. And old Peter is laying up on top of a, of a house. And the Bible says he has a vision. And in that vision, God speaks to him. And in Acts chapter 10, God comes to Peter and says, Peter, this, that, and the other thing. And here's what Peter says. All right? Read the whole chapter if you want to know more. But here's Peter's response to the voice from heaven speaking to him, which was God. Verse 14 of Acts chapter 10. But Peter said, Not so, Lord. <laughs> Are you getting this? Here's Acts chapter 10. And the Holy Spirit of God speaks to Peter. And the first thing out of Peter's meal mouth isn't, Okay, Lord, whatever you say, it's not so, Lord. <laughs> what a thing to say. So Peter's a horrible example of somebody you'd want to follow. It seems like he always starts out by saying the wrong thing. And it takes a minute or a little while before he finally ends up doing the right thing. And that's good. I mean, I'd rather someone say something wrong and then end up doing right than someone saying something right and then doing wrong. I mean, so, but Paul is our apostle. We'll get to that in a minute. But Peter, what a horrible example of someone to follow. Peter is not a great example of an apostle to follow. He's always opening his mouth and inserting his foot. He's always saying the wrong thing. What's the problem with this guy named Peter? Sounds like to me he's got some problems. Now, if you study the book of Acts, you find out that the first couple chapters of Acts is, is Jews preaching to Jews. And I've said this before, I don't need to go too in-depth with it, but chapter 7 of the book of Acts is a pivotal point because a guy named Stephen, which by the way, the word Stephen means martyr. Isn't that interesting? Stephen became a martyr for his faith. And the, is, is, the Israelis, the uh, Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, the, the religious leaders of Israel, stoned Stephen when he tried to point them to Jesus as their Messiah. And because they killed Stephen, then in the chapter that follows chapter 8, we have an Ethiopian eunuch get saved, a black man. Chapter 9, we have Paul, the apostle, saved. And Paul gets saved in chapter 9 of the book of Acts. Now, in chapter 10 and 11, Peter goes and gets some Gentiles saved. And then as the book of Acts continues, Acts chapter 13, Paul goes out preaching. And from then on, most of the book of Acts is all about Paul. So there's a change from Peter to Paul, from that apostle to this apostle. And there's always been this, this argument within Christianity of, is it Peter or is it Paul? Which one do you follow? Well, I follow Peter. No, I follow Paul. It's quite interesting. The Roman Catholic Church, they built themselves a gigantic, huge cathedral, and they call it St. Peter's. In the 1500s, the, the English people in England said, through the Catholic Church, they said, we're not going to have any part of you anymore, Catholicism. We don't agree with that. And they separated themselves. They started themselves the Church of England. They separated from Rome and the Roman Catholic Church. And what did they do? They built a gigantic cathedral and they called it St. Paul's. 
They said, we're going to follow Paul, not who you follow, Peter. Isn't that interesting? So, which one do you follow, Peter or Paul? You know, the old saying is, robbing Peter to pay Paul, or robbing Paul to pay Peter. I can't remember how it goes, but it's always been, okay, which is the one? Well, this is what we're doing today. We're rightly dividing, and when we rightly divide the apostles, we say, okay, Peter or Paul? Which is it? Which one do we follow today? Well, so far, Peter looks like a pretty bad person to follow. He's always saying the wrong thing. And he's, Jesus one time said, shut up, Satan, get behind me. Because <laughs> Peter spoke up and said something he shouldn't. God appears to him in chapter 10 of Acts. I mean, way out here. And he says, not so, Lord. I mean, Peter's having a time of it, isn't he? How can you follow this guy if it seems like he's having a hard time following the Lord? Now, I don't hate Peter. I'm not against the apostle Peter. But I want you to see Peter in context of the scriptures. You've got problems if you think Peter is the guy to follow. Because what I'm going to show you next is that Peter, his ministry was more to Jews, while Paul's ministry was more to Gentiles. And what it boils down to isn't, well, I'm just going to pick the one I like. What it boils down to is, what am I, and which one was more to me? If you're a Jew, and you lived before the transition, then you would have had to follow Peter. He would have been the one to follow, because he was the spokesman, he was the head, if you will, of the church, until James took over. But if you were a Gentile in the time of Paul, and even to today until the rapture, then the apostle that's more for you is the apostle Paul. Now why is that? Well, let me, let me get to that. Let me show you. But first of all, let's look at why Paul is in the Bible. Go with me to Galatians chapter 2. I want you to see why Paul says that he's in the Bible. Galatians chapter 2, and we're going to read here uh, verse 4 through 10. Here the Apostle Paul is speaking, and he says, here's a comparison of my ministry and a comparison of Peter's ministry. And he says, here's Peter, here's me. That's the difference. And it's so clear if you read the Bible. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 4 through 10. And that because of false brethren unawares brought in who came in privily to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us unto bondage to which we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But of these who seemed to me be somewhat whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me, God accepted no man's person. For they who seemed to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. Now notice what it says in verse 7. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision, who's that? The Gentiles, uncircumcision, was committed unto me, Paul speaking, as the gospel of the circumcision, the circumcision are the Jews, those who have been circumcised, was unto Peter. Now verse 8, he, he explains with these parentheses. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And then he says, And when James, Cephas, and John, Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go to the heathen, unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision, only that we should remember the poor, the same which I was also forward to do. So Peter is explaining the difference between Peter and Paul. As Peter, excuse me. Paul is explaining the difference between himself and Peter. And he says, Peter, his ministry was more to Jews than anything else. And Paul says, my ministry was more to Gentiles than anything else. Now, I'm not a hyperdispensationalist, so I will not stop there. Amen? Hyperdispensationalists say Peter was only to Jews and Paul was only to Gentiles. That's not true. I've already shown you that there was a time when Peter got to go preach to some Gentiles. Cornelius. And guess who Cornelius was? Cornelius was from Italy. He was an Italian guy. <laughs> this guy named Cornelius. And you want to see something interesting? This guy Cornelius comes down and he bows down before Peter. If you read the book of Acts. And the Catholics say Peter was the first pope. This guy Cornelius from Italy, an Italian. You know, that's where Rome is, Italy. Cornelius comes and bows before Peter. And Peter says, stand up, am I not also a man? <laughs> what a poor excuse for a pope that Peter is. Because nowadays there are popes in Rome and they command you, bow before me. And they say, and our first pope was Peter. Well, why don't they even listen to their own, their own apostle that they claim is their first pope? Peter said, do not worship me. Get up. Don't bow down before me. 
The popes of the day are horrible. They don't even read the Bible. They don't even follow Peter. If they followed the Bible, they'd realize, hey, guess what? I can go get married. And they should. But nowhere in the Bible is there a pope anyway. So here we have the Apostle Paul explaining, look, God called Peter to go more to Jews, and God called me to go more to Gentiles. But that doesn't mean Peter didn't go to Gentiles. He did. He, he got to go to Cornelius, a Gentile, win him to the Lord. And that doesn't mean that Paul didn't go to Jews. Wherever Paul went, the first place he did, the first door he darkened, was the synagogue. He'd always go to the Jew first, and then to the Greek. That's why we read Paul in his writings, he says time and again, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Why in Romans 1.16 he says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul was always like, hey, I'm to the Jew first. But yet, even though he went to the Jews first, he says, God called me more as an evangelist or a missionary to Gentiles. And God called Peter more as the apostle or the missionary to the Jews. So there is a distinction if you rightly divide the word of truth. If you go to the Bible, you'll find out that Peter was more to Jews and Paul was more to Gentiles. And that's how God set it up. That's the way God wanted it to be. But you can't say that Peter was only to Jews and Paul was only to Gentiles. No, they both preached to either one. But the, the, the ministry they had was ministering Peter more ministered more to Jews, and Paul ministered more, in his, ultimately, in his ministry, to Gentiles. Now, in Acts chapter 13, Paul preaches to Jews. We went into that a little bit last time as we rightly divided the New Testament. So who is Paul, and what does Paul say about himself? Well, in Romans chapter 11, verse 13, this reiterates what I've just told you, that Paul said he was more of a missionary or an apostle to the Gentiles. And in Romans 11, 13, Paul is speaking, and Paul says, For I speak to you Gentiles, and as much as I am the apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my office. So the apostle Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. That's what he says by his own mouth, in his own writings, that that's what God called him to be, is the apostle to the Gentiles. Now, was the apostle Paul an apostle? Yes. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Remember, whole Judas fell. So God had to replace that and had to have his 12 uh, apostles. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I want to read verse 8 through 10. Here's what Paul says. 1 Corinthians 15, 8. And last of all, he was seen of me. Who's that? Jesus. Also, as of one born out of due time. For I am the least, I am the least of the apostles. And am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. By the grace of God I am what I am, and His grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which is in me. So Paul says, I shouldn't be called an apostle because I persecuted the true church. But that's what I am. By God's grace, I'm an apostle. And he said, and in Romans 11.13, he said, I am the apostle to the Gentiles. Now, are you a Jew? Are you a Gentile? You've got this gigantic denomination that calls themselves the Roman Catholic Church. And they're sitting there, and they're full of Gentiles, and they claim their apostle is Peter, and he was the apostle that was more to Jews. And you've got this guy over here, Paul, that says, Come unto me, I'm the apostle to the Gentiles. And those in Italy and Rome say, Shut up, Paul. Does that not seem odd to you? You see, Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. And the Catholics, if they want to follow the scriptures, and a lot of times they don't, they should come to the apostle Paul. But they don't. I've never met a Catholic yet that follows Paul. I've never seen yet the St. Paul's Catholic Church. It's always the emphasis on Peter and Mary and, and Jesus, but not on Paul. Why do the Catholics hate Paul so much? Well, because Paul corrects them and corrects their apostle. They claim their apostle is Peter, and Paul says, I withstood Peter to the face that he was wrong. So what is our apostle today? Well, you know, the word apostle appears... Well, actually, okay, let me say this. I want to get this right. The word apostles, plural, with an S, appears 60 times in 59 verses in the Bible. 
the word apostle, singular, appears 19 times in 19 verses. So 79 times we have the word apostle in singular or plural. And there's another word, apostleship, that appears four times in the King James Bible. So I looked up the word apostle in the Bible and I was surprised. If you get Esword, go to Esword and download it for free and uh, look up the word apostle. And out of the 19 times that the word apostle appears, 16 of those times it applies to this guy. 16 times out of 19 that the word apostle shows up in the New Testament, it's Paul saying, I'm the apostle, I'm an apostle, I'm an apostle. The other three times, one is Hebrews 3.1, Jesus, and the other two are 1 Peter 1.1 1, 1 and 2 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. So there's twice in the New Testament that Peter refers to himself as an apostle. Once that Jesus is called an apostle. 16, is that right? Yeah, 16 times the word apostle applies to Paul. I mean, <laughs> you think God is trying to show us something? That Paul is the apostle for us today in the church age? Now, why is Paul in the Bible? A lot of people don't understand this. And, and the problem with Christianity today is the majority of those so-called Christian denominations in the world today, they all have one thing in common. They leave Paul out. They don't read Paul's books. They want nothing to do with Paul. They say, I don't believe in Paul. And they say, fooey on Paul. And they go and they get all their doctrine from anywhere in the New Testament but Paul. Anywhere but Paul. Why do they do that? Because they don't rightly divide. So they've set up a cult. They've set up a false denomination with false teachings. Now, why Paul? I've got to get through this quickly. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 11, Paul tells us why he's in the Bible. And why we're to follow him, because he's the apostle of the Gentiles, and we're Gentiles today. Why, why Paul? Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 11, he says, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. So Jesus himself revealed something to Paul. What is the revelation of Jesus to Paul? The gospel. And Jesus revealed to Paul some mysteries as well. But that gospel that God told Paul to go preach among the Gentiles is how we're saved today. So do you understand that? If you reject Paul, and you say, no, no, our church follows Peter, then you've just rejected something that Jesus revealed to Paul. And what was it? The gospel of salvation. So you're not saved. You're following Peter, and you're on your way to hell. When you ought to be following Paul in order to get to heaven. And maybe it's better to say you ought to be following the gospel that God gave to Paul. Amen? But then again, the Bible does say, be ye followers of me. Paul says three times, follow me, be ye followers of me. So who is your apostle? People ask me, who's my apostle? I say, well, number one, Jesus is my high apostle. He's, he's my heavenly apostle. But the apostle in the Bible that God gave to me is the apostle Paul. And I'm to be a follower of Paul. So that's Galatians chapter 1 and uh, verse 16. To reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. So God did a revelation. He revealed to Paul something to preach to the Gentiles. What is it? Well, it's the 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4 gospel. Now let's go over here and look at some more stuff real quick. Galatians chapter 2, verse 2. Galatians 2, 2 says, And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately them which were... So he says, I went to the apostles in Jerusalem, verse 1, and gave them the revelation that Jesus gave to me of preaching this gospel. What is this gospel? A gospel of salvation by grace through faith. I'm going to bismell, bismell through on purpose. Grace through faith. It's the gospel of salvation by believing it upon the finished work or the blood atonement of Christ. Unless you're following Paul, then you're not even believing in the right gospel. And that's what the Bible teaches. Now, I don't have time to get into this. I tried to explain it a little bit last week. But in Acts chapter 15 is when Paul went back to the early church and went to these other apostles. And he told them, look, from what God's showing me that we're, we're saved today by grace. 
And in Acts 15 and verse 11, look that up sometime, Peter stands up and he says, you know what? We believe that we shall be saved by grace through faith, even as they. Peter says, we believe what Paul says. We believe that revelation that Jesus gave to you, Paul, that you're saved by grace through faith. And Peter says, we agree, salvation is by grace through faith. So Peter says, here, here, I concur. I accept the revelation of Jesus given to you, Paul. And from then on, it's all about Paul in the book of Acts. Because that is the revelation for the church today, that salvation is by grace through faith. In fact, you must come through that gospel that was revealed by Jesus to Paul to be saved or you're going to burn in hell. That's what the Bible teaches. What is that gospel? 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. Moreover, I declare unto you the gospel, Paul says, which I preached unto you, which ye have also received, and wherein you stand. Verse 2, by which also you are saved. All right? If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain, vain is vanity, trusting in something you do, or self, or, or vain means you, you didn't believe from the heart, you just believed from the head. Verse 3, For I deliver unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, that He was buried and rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. How did Jesus die? By the blood atonement. So that gospel is all about faith in the blood. And so Paul is running around telling everybody, trust the blood atonement, trust what Jesus did. It's all about what Jesus did for you, trust that. And that's the gospel of salvation. Where did he get it from? Did he get it from Peter? No. He says he got it from Jesus. And Peter says, wow, you got that from Jesus? Well, I take that for us too. He said, we'll accept that too, us Jews. Now you go to Romans chapter 2, verse 16, you see one of the most powerful verses in the entire Bible. This brings it all together, the importance of having the Apostle Paul as your Apostle. Romans chapter 2 and verse 16, Paul says, In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Someday, when people die, and they stand before God at the great white throne of judgment, the first thing that Jesus Christ is going to say is, Well, what would you do with Paul's gospel? If they say, well, no, 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 my apostle was Peter. Jesus will say, depart from me, I never knew you, into everlasting fire. I revealed to Paul how to get to me, to salvation. And you rejected it. Go to hell. Why would Jesus do that? Because he thought that you could rightly divide the word of truth. He thought you would get in the Bible and read it and see this. But you see, a lot of denominations don't. They would rather not rightly divide the word of truth, and they would say, well, no, we just do this, we do this, and they don't rightly divide. So, let's go quickly. Oh, so much more. So much more. Here we've got another one, all right? We looked at Simon Peter. We saw Peter. Peter was more to the Jews, more to Jews than anything else. Yes, he got some Gentiles saved, and he eventually got on the same as Paul in Acts. Acts 15.11 are Peter's words. Remember that. He basically says, Peter basically says, I accept the gospel of Paul. And that's what we're going to preach from now on. So we looked at Peter, then we looked at Paul, now we're going to look at John. Now here's another thing. There's a lot of folks out there that say, well, I follow the Apostle John. Well, the Apostle John is an interesting apostle. And I'm just going to throw out some speculation there here real quick. <laughs> I don't know what else to do, but, but present this. I think it's interesting. But is John our apostle? I just gave you the verse where Paul says he is the apostle to the Gentiles. So who is our apostle today in the church age if we're a Gentile? Apostle Paul. Alright, so does that mean that, that Peter's our apostle? No, Paul said he was. So does that mean John is our apostle? No, Paul said he was. So we have these other apostles, but most of these other apostles, if not all of them, they stayed close to Peter, and so they were continually going to the Jews more than the Gentiles. Yes, they didn't accept this message of Paul, but they still stuck with their own people, the Jews. So when you go read the book of James, when you go read the book of John, and 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, when you go read these other books in the Bible, um, you've got to remember, that's, that's not written to Gentiles. Paul is writing to Gentiles. So we come to a guy named 1 John, uh, 1 John a guy named John, who wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and the book of John. Now, there's a lot of good stuff in those books. He had a lot of good influence from the Apostle uh, Paul. 
But there's something about him that's quite interesting. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, or chapter 1 and verse 15. 2 Timothy 1 15. We read something quite interesting. I think it's 415. No, it's 115. This is the last book that Paul writes before he dies. Full book. And he says in 2 Timothy 1.15, This thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me, of whom are by jealous and Hermogenes. So the end of his ministry, Paul says, there's some people in Asia that turned against me. Now, I don't have time to draw a map out here and show you who is in Asia. But if you go to the book of Revelation, guess who wrote the book of Revelation? I think this is so interesting. The people ask me all the time, Brother Breaker, will you do a message about the seven churches in the book of Revelation? And I, okay, one of these days, if I ever get to it. But you go to the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation was written by the Apostle John. And John wrote this book, and notice what it says in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 4. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia. Asia, well that's where the place is where everyone that was supposedly a Christian turned against Paul. So he's writing to those people that turned against Paul in the book of Revelation. Again in verse 11, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest write in the book, and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. Asia. That, Paul said, was the place where people turned against him. Now, I don't know what to do with that. Amen? All I can do is read the Bible, and I read 1 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, and Peter says he's writing to the strangers in Asia. So, John is a little weird in some of the things he says in his book. And as you're reading and you're rightly dividing the apostles, what you find is that Peter and the other apostles are very Jewish, and then they pretty much stay with the Jewish people. Paul ends up going more with the Gentile people. And I just read you where, where Paul rebukes Peter to his face for what? For withdrawing himself from Gentiles. When in Christ we're all the same, we, we're not different. So you see in the Bible that there's this, this, this tendency of these Jews to go back to their own people. While the Gentiles, while they're, they get saved and they, and they don't. So I don't want to get in there and speculate too much, but I think it's interesting as you read. Um, people ask me, what do you do with the seven churches, Brother Breaker? Well, literally, they were seven churches in Asia. And if they're in Asia, then that means they weren't looking as Paul as their apostle. Uh, some people take the seven churches and apply it to the church age, the seven different periods. And, and that's another study I'll do sometime. But uh, one time I was in a church in Tennessee, and the pastor said, you know, I was reading through Revelation chapter 2 and 3 about these seven churches and a lot of people try to apply those seven churches to the church age today and he says it doesn't make much sense because it looks almost like you can lose your salvation in these seven churches and he says and I had a thought I said what if what if these are seven churches in the tribulation and I was like huh Oh, that makes sense. <laughs> that, that would be why God's saying, I know your works, you know, and if you don't do this, then I'll do that. And so so it, it could be. It could be that God used the Apostle John more to write to Jews. Now, I don't have time. Man, I'm running out of time. I don't have time to, to write up here all the books of the Bible and the New Testament in order of what they're written. If you get a chance, go to my video on YouTube entitled, The... Um, the order of the books of the King James Bible. Because in our Bible, the order of the books of the Bible are in order, more or less, of the history of what's going to happen. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were all about this time period here. The next one is the book of Acts. Then you have Romans through Philemon. The next book is the book of Hebrews. Well, when the rapture comes to place, Jesus Christ is, is going to go back to dealing with his people, the Jews, Hebrews. And so the next book after Hebrews is James. James was one of the, now it might be this James, it might be that James, but there's also the James, the, the brother of Jesus. So it's, you get confusing with your James. But the book of James says it's written to the twelve tribes scattered abroad. Where are they scattered? They'll be scattered in the tribulation. Then you have First and Second John, First, Second, uh, Third John, First, Second Peter, and then all these other books, and then you have Jude and Revelation, and, and, and they all seem to apply more out here to a Jewish message. Well, when is the message more Jewish? After the rapture, it all goes back to dealing with the Jews. 
So what people do is they don't rightly divide the apostles. And so a lot of folks nowadays, they'll go to 1 John and they'll try to get doctrine out of 1 John and force it into the church age, and that's kind of hard to do. So what you have to understand is our apostle today is the apostle Paul. And where the other apostles agree with Paul, then we can dogmatically state, yes, that is church age doctrine. But if they say something that's not in agreement with Paul, then we have to go, uh-oh, uh-oh, what do we do? And God said we follow Paul. So what do I do? Well, I have to rightly divide. So it can get a little bit hard to do. I wish I had more time. I have a lot more information here I wanted to give you, especially about this guy named John. I like the Apostle John. There's a lot of good things in the book of John, but then again, there's some strange things in the book of John, in, in 1 John and 2 John. John is all about following Jesus' commandments, following Jesus' commandments. Well, Paul says, well, you follow me, follow my doctrine, follow my commandments. And yet John's saying, no, follow Jesus' commandments. So which one is it? You go to uh, uh, the book of Romans, chapter 15, and Paul tells us in verse 8, Jesus' ministry was to Jews, my ministry is more to the Gentiles. So there's some right division that needs to take place as you read the Bible. Man, I wanted to get into this so much more. There's just not time. But in his ministry, Paul got angry. And you can go to Galatians chapter 2. Go to Galatians chapter 2, verse 11 through 21, and Galatians 3, 1 through 3. And in his ministry, Paul ran into some people that said, you know, we're going to go back to the law rather than continuing in this message. And Paul wrote the whole book of Galatians saying, no, when you're saved, you're not a Jew and under the law. You're saved by grace through faith. So there might be some of that that went on in, in Paul's time, and that's why those churches in Asia turned against him. Someone came in and scooped up his converts and turned them back to the Old Testament law. Well, if you study Paul, you realize we're not under the law today. We're under grace. We're not saved by keeping commandments. We're saved by trusting the gospel and being spirit-filled. And when we're filled with the Spirit, then we're going to do right. You know, we don't have to follow the commandments in the flesh. When we walk in the Spirit, we'll automatically do right. You know what I'm saying? So we're automatically following God and doing what pleases Him. So our apostle today is the Apostle Paul. Let's go to 2 Peter 3, verse 13 through 16. Here's what Peter has to say about Paul. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 13 through 16. Nevertheless, we, according to the promise, look for the new heavens and the new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. No, we don't. No, we don't, Peter. <laughs> Peter is writing to whoever he's writing to, and he says, Now, we're looking for a new heaven and a new earth. When is that? The end of the millennium. No, if we're studying Paul and we're in Paul's writings, we're looking for the rapture. It's interesting how Peter doesn't mention the rapture here. Um, he's talking about bypassing the rapture and looking for a new heaven and a new earth. That's kind of odd. So as you read through 2 Peter and 1 Peter, there is some good stuff that we can take to us, but if it doesn't line up with Paul, then it shows you that it sounds very Jewish, like he was just writing to Jews. Do you, do you get that? And he says here, verse 14, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. 15, And account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, okay? Sounds like Peter loved Paul if he's calling him a beloved brother. Also according to the wisdom given him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. So he says, remember Paul, read his epistles, look into that. God gave him wisdom. And people that don't follow Paul, what do they do? He says, they rest the scriptures to their own destruction. So unless you rightly divide the apostles and rightly divide the New Testament and rightly divide the Word of God, you're going to end up with false doctrine. Like this church that says the first pope was Peter. Yeah, if he was a pope, then why was he married? If he was the first pope, then Jesus called the first pope Satan and said, get behind me. If he was the first pope, how come an Italian came up to him and bowed down before him and he says, get up, don't worship me? What is this? Someone's not rightly dividing. They don't understand why the Apostle Paul is in the Bible. So let's close with 2 Timothy. Oh, man, you know, I, I try so hard to get through this and without going too long, but I hope it's been a blessing to you. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Stick with Paul. Now, I'm not saying 
that means you can't read any of the other apostles. No, I want you to read the entire Bible. I think you should read the entire Bible. Read John. Read James. Read every book in the Bible. But, rightly divide. Realize what God revealed to us Gentiles today is the Paul's writings. And we go to Paul's writings for the doctrine of the church. Now there's some writings, like the book of James, that are very hard to apply to the church age today. You read the very first verse of the book of James, and it says it's not even written to the church. It says it's written to the, what? It's written to the twelve tribes scattered abroad. I'm not one of the twelve tribes scattered abroad. I'm not a Jew. It's hard to take the book of James and apply it to me doctrinally. There's a lot of good spiritual stuff in it. But it's more to Jews. Now, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8 through 13, and I'm done. Stick a fork in me. Amen. 2 Timothy 1, 8 through 13. Apostle Paul is speaking. 2 Timothy 1, 8. Be thou, be not thou, therefore, ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. We need this gospel to be saved. We're going to be judged by this gospel which was given to this guy, Paul. He is our apostle. So when we rightly divide the apostles, we find, oh, that's the way of salvation today through the gospel of 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. Verse 9, Who has saved us, who's that? God, and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. So salvation is by grace, not by works. How come this big church in Rome says that Peter was their founder and it tells you you're saved by works? When if they came to Paul, Paul says you're saved by grace, not by works. They don't rightly divide. He says, verse 10, But is now made manifest, who's that, Jesus, by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the what? Through the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. For the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Now verse 13. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me. Paul is speaking. Paul says, remember my doctrine. Remember what I said. Remember my words because I am your apostle. And I'm your apostle because, not because I, Paul, said so, because Jesus says so. And Jesus gave me a revelation to give to you that this is the gospel of salvation, and this is how you're saved. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou have heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. So this is how to rightly divide the apostles. It's understanding the apostle for us today is the apostle Paul. He is our apostle, and we're saved by trusting the gospel of 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4 that God gave to him. And that's our gospel. And Romans 2.16 says we're all going to be judged someday based upon whether or not we have trusted 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. So are you saved? Do you have the right apostle even? <laughs> if not, get to him. Get to Paul. Read what he says. Find the way of salvation, because Jesus revealed to Paul the way to be saved. It's through the gospel of 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. I thank you for watching. I look forward to next time. We'll see you then. Bye-bye.